Dr. John Chastain from Clemson. He'll, I'll let you take over and maybe a little bit of self-introduction. Okay. I'm John Chastain. I'm an extension ag engineer at Clemson University, and I've been doing that there for about oh, 28 years. And then before that, I was at University of Minnesota three and a half years. So I actually had spring days like the ones we've had this week. So it was like old times. But uh, in the, on my lanyard, I got the little red poop, but you need to go times two. That's 15 years isn't enough for me. So today's uh, talk is really focused on one thing. And, and it's really this question. When we actually irrigate any kind of manure, lagoon water, slurry, what have you, do I really accentuate ammonia loss? Because I've been in many places around the country, everybody say, oh, you irrigate that stuff, you're blowing that ammonia. Well, really? Are we doing that? And so, you know, I, I care about it. a couple of things. Number one, it's a loss of fertilizer value. We've talked about this already today. It's a potential air pollutant, PM2.5, 2.5. And the basic idea was that people have been having is that when we irrigate lagoon water, slurry, whatever, I have an extra piece that's lost while it's flying through the air. Okay. And so I had a graduate student do some new data, and then I've now pooled this with everything we have to basically try to answer that. And this is important because I've got regulators in the US, I got regulators in Canada, I got regulators in Europe who are ruling out irrigation completely. Even if I have a system where I treat the water well. So if I go through a multi-step treatment system, I end up with a huge volume, relatively low odor, and it costs a lot of energy to haul it around. Pumping it is more cost effective and more energy efficient. So there are five studies when we first started looking at this um, that talked about this. And there's a significant amount of ammonia was lost during, the, it, they looked at this loss during irrigation animal manure. And I'm saying, as I'm really looking at flying through the air, do we lose more? And like I've already mentioned this, got ahead of myself. And I've got some, this is a simple dairy in South Carolina, it has two steps of solid liquid separation and then you can final treatment in a pond lagoon. You see the island. That's why they added the separation in because they want to get rid of that. But guess what? Their water was greatly reduced in nutrients. We have more advanced systems. So if people are going to say we can't use irrigation, we're, we're penalizing those individuals that are doing a lot of the things we want them to do. So we're also not talking about after it hits the ground. Now, after it hits the ground, you know, we've got slurries, we've got 18, 25% losses, swine lagoon. We can have some losses, so we'll talk about that some more tomorrow. So basically, my objective here is to summarize some results that we have in a paper where we pulled together 55 data sets, 55 paired comparisons, everything we could get. And from a T-statistic standpoint, that's, that's pretty good. And we're going to look at volatilization of ammonia and also evaporation. We, we know what to expect on evaporation expect around 2%. So we've got a paper if you want to look at all the gory details. Basically, we had data from five studies where they use what I call the irrigate tech catch technique. In other words, they have some way of sampling what's irrigated to know what's in it when it leaves the nozzle. And then they would catch it in a container on the ground and analyze it afterwards. Being, okay, change in concentration, I've got loss. That basic idea. There were three studies that had the required data. One's a very old one. It was a thesis done up in, I think, Crookston, Minnesota. And that included some highly treated dairy waste water with, or maybe, excuse me, beef cattle, with an oxidation ditch all the way up to around 8% dairy slurries or big guns. And he concluded, he didn't have many points, but he concluded there was no loss. And then Safley and others from NC State did a study in the, with uh, lagoon waters. And they're the ones that concluded there was a loss. And in fact, to be frank with you, when Montes, who was my grad student, started his, we assumed there was. Okay. And we situated it to try to see if it did it in the forest that I reduce those losses. Well, we didn't have any, to tell you the truth. So, we, so after his thesis was done, we've done some other things and we want to pull them all together. 
And so basically we looked at three characteristics in this. One is the total solids content, you know, moisture, 100 minus moisture. Total Keldol nitrogen. We obviously knew the total, and, 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 and I can't say the word, we'll call it TAN, which is basically ammonium plus ammonia. And so we're going, okay, total solids should change because I should see evaporation, okay? What about the other two? If I see a change in TAN, I should see a change in both. Now, Again, the fraction of tan and ammonia, a fraction of tan that is ammonium in is strongly pH dependent and temperature dependent. And so if we look at pH is seven to eight and got some very the temperature, we can be 0.6 to 10% of tan actually being ammonia form, okay? So basically, if we look at in general, we're typically about 10% tan, okay? Is in there when it leaves. Sometimes less, typically less actually. So here's a summary of the three data sets, it's really four, two in one study, where we had the data to do this. And the first one's a big gun. This is a Minnesota study. Notice that TAN, we're looking at 11 ppm to 850. That 11 ppm is that highly treated uh, wastewater from a beef, actually it's oxidation ditch, all the way up to 850. Got the TS so irrigated, and they averaged minus two and a half, he only had five in five, but said, okay, no loss. The second two were from Safley's study. One's a center pivot, one's a big, big gun. Uh, basically swine lagoons in North Carolina, six and 12. And then we had a solid set system. We actually had two of them, two different lagoons. And Felipe got 32 points and we went from 110 to 1183 on the, on the 10. So we put that all together. That's, that was the objective. To give you an idea, this is one of our setups where we could get a sample right out of the pipe, going to the nozzles, leaving the lagoon, heading to the nozzles, and then uh, after it was done, caught it in little simple containers, put it in there, got it on ice, got it to the lab. So simple analysis, put everything together. You know, if I have no, you know, Origin should be zero, zero. So Y equals BX is the form for all of them. And the big question is, is, is the slope significantly different from one? If there's no loss, slope's one. If they're the same, slope's one. So did a little ANOVA on that. We did a 95% confidence interval test on that slope. You know, it's, it's the CI, how is it different from one? So did evaporation occur? We got a slope of 1.024, and that was significant. Actually, it's highly significant. Nice R square. And so basically, we could back out roughly 2.5% loss in water. If we look at irrigation stuff, when we go assume stuff to design irrigation, we shoot for around 2%, unless we're doing something fancy. So it was, you know, right what we expected. One to three is what we can see in the literature. Now, tan. What's the slope? I had to make four nines, so I didn't put one, okay? It, it actually wasn't close. Notice we got a pretty good distribution of tan there. And of course, TKN shouldn't be significant either, significantly over one either, and it wasn't as well. So why did Safley and those other guys say we had a loss? I'm not going to go through all the gore. It's in the paper. We did some uncertainty analysis and that kind of thing. But basically what they attempted to do was kind of a mass balance on it. And they basically used, they did, just for the center pivot study, they, they used what we call a recovery area kind of idea in, in uh, irrigation stuff. And when they included what they called evaporate and drift, they said, okay, we lost 13.9 to 37.3% of the tan when we irrigated. So we went through a lot of analysis and go, what's the difference? But if we look at the average for just this, it was 4.9. And we already included that in our study and said, wait a minute, there's no difference when we look at them all. A short way of putting this is the amount of water that fell outside of the irrigate area, they basically used center pivot irrigation type techniques where we look at what we don't get where we want it. So the amount of water that fell outside the irrigate area was counted 
by default and how they calculated that loss. So basically, it didn't go in the air. If you think of a center pivot, I want everything inside this circle. They counted more than went outside the circle is going to the air. If you sat down and look at, that's, that's where the, and, and we call this recovery area in irrigation. And just to give you an idea, here's a standard uncertainty estimate based on typical items of recovery area, one of them being evaporation at 2% and 20% and loss because of, of getting outside of my circle. So I can calculate, I should see a 23.4% recovery error for a center pivot. Most designs, that's the way it's done. From Safley's data, he had 23. It's the same. Now there's more detail in the paper, there's more gore there, but basically, we, we counted stuff that went outside that circle and it got into that estimate. That's how that happened. So take home point one, we got the evaporation we expected. Two, ammonia volatilization didn't occur. Actually, there's some more theoretical reasons why it can't, but the data shows it clearly and it wasn't even close. This recovery error is where, where that's, this idea crept in, oh, maybe 15% loss. And to be frank with you, that's what we assumed we started. The results of the study does not imply that ammonia volatilization after the manure strikes the ground is not to be ignored. We're just focusing in on flying through the air, the act of irrigating. You know, it still has a, a potential, um, but we need to evaluate, should we irrigate based on things like odor? Uh, do I need to uh, incorporate immediately? By the way, we, by the way, we count irrigated lagoon water as incorporated. We have very, it goes into the ground. We'll, I'll do a little thing tomorrow that shows some of that. So we're not saying ignore this. We're not saying irrigation is always right. If I've got an agitated uh, dairy uh, storage pond that's stinking nice at 6% and I blow it through a big gun and it's the, the field near the road, that's probably still a bad idea but it's not because of ammonia loss. It's because odor, or maybe I do need to get incorporated like I need to in this watershed. Irrigation doesn't incorporate for us. You can later. So, but if I've got significant amounts of biological treatment, even on simple systems where I'm dropping, dropping the total solids to a half percent or even 0.2% in my final huge volume of water, I sure don't want to X out irrigation as a way to use that on land. Just think about the energy, think about the carbon, all the things we talk about. Basically, I make it more difficult, more expensive, more costly not to have irrigation as a technique, especially if somebody's doing advanced treatment. This applies to dairy, swine, whatever. Because, you know, pumping takes less energy than hauling liquids with a tank spreader or truck. Simple as that. And with that, I think I got done early. So we've got time for questions. If I didn't, if I blew something through something too quick, which I'm sure I did. So how was temperature uh, brought into this analysis? The temperature happened. Okay. So like in South Carolina, I did it in spring and fall. I had warm and cool weather. And Minnesota must have always been cold. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> it actually is warm. Um, and then and same, same thing happened in, in, in North Carolina. So we had cool and warm temperatures all in that data set. Okay. So, so if you look at the stuff, I mean, temperature is a factor, but the pH is the big one. But it really came down to it. It wasn't in the air long enough for it to really volatilize. Yes, sir. I was going to ask about pH if you, if you did it with any where you had pH of 9 or 10. I've measured I didn't put pH. this in here. We have it, and it's in the paper but we are in that seven to eight range. Oh, yeah. And guess, yeah, but I, I don't, I haven't ever sampled a swine lagoon in South Carolina where we've had a nine or 10 pH. Maybe you must be doing something special. <laughs> but still, what that does, that'll increase the amount of ammonia that could be lost, okay? But um, it's still gotta be in the air long enough for it to happen. You get into the, the massive diffusivity of water vapor into air versus ammonia into air. It pretty much says ammonia takes longer. That, that's, that's the physics reason. And Felipe did that, but said, let's don't talk about that because that 
it's really gets you off in the weeds too much, but I just did. So, so yeah, temperature's in there because we did vary the climate. Yes. Yes. Well, it, it's, it's a diffusion. Okay. Yeah. The question was, what's, what's, what's the mechanism for ammonia volatilization? How, how would that be right? It's kind of like evaporation, but it's really mass diffusion of whatever you're thinking about into air. Okay. And so I've mentioned this mass diffusivity thing. Well, that, that's dependent upon several things, the material that's volatilizing, what it's volatilizing into. And so that's at the basis of it. And so basically water can, we had water evaporate in the time it went through the air and we've seen it all the time. And we play with nozzle sizes and pressures to minimize that in irrigation. But guess what? It wasn't there long enough to see the ammonia loss. So it's really, you know, here I down, this is a very simple experiment. We added on, but it's like, hey, we can do this. And we, we already knew the literature. I only got a handful of data that we're making all these decisions on. Let's see what we can get. And then we looked at, whoa, it's not what we thought. Let's now pool it once we got the other stuff done to see, you know, can I see anything across a broad range of manures? There's a broad range in this data set. All the data is tabulated in the paper if you want to go get it. It's in the appendix, every bit of it. Yes. So is there sufficient data on the volatilization once it hits the ground? Like, do you think that there's enough literature on that? I'm going to talk about that tomorrow just for swine. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to use everything I can get my hands on. Do we need more? Yes. Um, my point tomorrow is going to be, we're not even using what we got. Okay. <laughs> it was a pretty weird. Didn't we're, sell it away yet. Yeah, but we're not using what we got. So, and it's important and it's really important. We need to know better. So based on your experience from this study, how do you think, um, would that change the, the way with, at which, um, Nitrogen is being managed. Uh, do you see yes. it? Uh, because when we, we like to talk about available nitrogen, we use the term plant available nitrogen in South Carolina to emphasize what we're looking at. And if I think I'm losing something that I'm not losing, guess what? I'm changing all my nutrient management calculations. And the gist of tomorrow is going to be what difference does that make? And I'm just going to do a couple examples, but you'll see it makes a and I'm gonna compare it to what we do in Clemson Extension. You know, I'm, I'll pick a own house, put it that way. I won't pick on yours, I'll pick on mine. But yeah, it, 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 makes, it makes a big difference. Especially for the lagoon, lagoon people or highly treated water people. Question maybe? Oh, great job, John. Um, I think nozzles have changed and evolved over time. Do you think there was uh, the earlier studies? Do you think you saw aerosol no. departure no. outside of that circle that it was making? Uh, you, good question. Everybody here is nozzle size makes a big difference. If I'm looking at a big gun, I'm not having aerosols. And on the center pivot, they had bigger nozzles. And then we used a big solid set half inch to, or higher bores on those. So if I go, so we all, this is really key because if we're irrigating water, we don't want to evaporate it. And by having the water droplet go smaller, we enhance evaporation. Okay. So that was kind of already baked into the mix because we we're looking at old fashioned big guns, a impact sprinkler, big one on a center pivot versus uh, the biggest rainbird impact sprinkler was one of the biggest novel sets on it on our study that we can move around. Now, if I'm looking at some of our new drop hoses, I'm going low pressure, I'm doing everything I can to reduce evaporation, that actually is in my favor on this. You know, so I'm not gonna obviously put a slurry through that, but if I have a highly treated wastewater, I have people that do. I mean, they got, I mean, we're looking half percent solids less. Okay, it'll go through. And I have some filters too. But.